If I told you there is something that you could do that will change, perhaps even radically change, the complexion of your whole life for the good, would you want to know what it is? And what if I told you that you can do it no matter what shape you're in, no matter what state you're in, no matter what your circumstances, no matter how you're feeling, no matter who you are or where you are, would that encourage you? Yes. And what if I told you that it makes you happier, it makes you more positive, it makes you more hopeful, it even makes you more pleasant to be around. It calms your fears, and by the way, it is not illegal, though it may be a little addictive, okay? It costs nothing, and yet it makes you a whole lot richer. Would you want to know what it is? Yes. Would you like me to tell you? Yes. It's giving thanks. Yes. It's giving thanks. This weekend, we're celebrating Thanksgiving. And you know, I think it's awesome that we have a day or a weekend where we celebrate Thanksgiving. But you know, even more profoundly than every day is Christmas, truly for the believer, the child of God, every day is Thanksgiving. Every day is Thanksgiving. And having this reminder, having this time is, is good to remind us that it is, but we, we need to understand, it's so important for us to remember that thanksgiving is huge on God's priority list. The word thank in its various forms is found in the scriptures 150 times. Do you think that maybe God's trying to get something through to us? You know, the scripture says in the mouth of two or three, let everything be established. Well, what about the mouth of 150? And in the Psalms alone, it is found 35 times. And this is beside such words as rejoice, be joyful, praise, all that stuff. Just simply giving thanks. Thanksgiving in its various forms. 150 times in Scripture, 35 times in the Psalms. Some examples are Psalm 717 where it says, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 100 and verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, praise his name. And then Psalm 105, 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. And finally, uh, though not finally as to what's in the Psalms, but for this morning, Psalm 106, 1 says, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Now, all of these verses that we have been looking at from the Psalms this morning speak of either choosing to give thanks or, in fact, being exhorted or commanded to give thanks. But one thing that we can understand from this is that it's always possible to give thanks. We can choose to do so. We are instructed or commanded to do so. It is within the possibility of our will to give thanks to God. And so he says to give thanks. Now, the reverse is we are cautioned against the opposite with such things as complaining or grumbling. In fact, the apostle Paul uses the, the history of the Israelites to say, to warn us against that kind of thing. And just briefly in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 9 and 10, it says, we should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angels. Now, when we murmur and we grumble, this may not we may not get bitten by poisonous snakes, and we may not be killed by the destroying angel, but the reality is, is death comes into our soul just the same. When we engage in murmuring and complaining, it brings about a dearth. It brings about a death within us. And so we are cautioned against that. We are exhorted not to engage in that. But when it comes to Thanksgiving, we are invited to fill our boots because it is the best thing that we can be doing. And so we're told... In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, many of us are seeking the Lord, saying, God, I'm looking to you. 
I want to know what your will is for my life. Would you please lead me? Well, I've got an answer for you. God's will is for you to give thanks in all circumstances. It's spelled out so clear, and that's one thing that we can be certain of. I believe, I believe, and I say this with full conviction, that thanksgiving, giving thanks is one of the most underrated activities that we can be engaged, engaged in. It seems so simple. It's so easy, and yet the reality is it is so underrated. In fact, I am convinced that in 1 Corinthians 10, where it talks about the weapons that we have, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, I am convinced that thanksgiving is one of those weapons, that it is a weapon God has given us, one that, an arrow in our quiver that just sits there so often and unused, but yet it is a weapon that God has given us to demolish strongholds. I preached on this last night, and someone came up to me after the service, and they shared an experience they had. They were driving along, and they could remember the exact moment and the exact location where they were when it happened. They were driving along, and they were complaining about their life. <laughs> they were complaining about just, and, and basically what they were saying is, God, you're in control, and you have not treated me well, and you have messed me up. And so the Lord brought them up short and said, you know, you're acting like a spoiled little child. And, uh, which was a blessing, I'm sure, to hear, you know. But, but at that moment, it's God, it, God had stopped him in his tracks, and he was in such a funk, but the Lord called him on it. And he began to give thanks to the Lord, and he said it was absolutely supernatural what happened. He began to thank the Lord, and things changed completely. It's like this cloud that was over him just lifted. Poof, it was gone. And he had joy rise in his heart. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 that the devil is the accuser of who? The brothers, right? The brothers and sisters in Christ. The devil is accuser of them. But that's not the only one he accuses. The devil also accuses God. And we see this in Genesis chapter 3 when the devil is tempting Eve and he's saying, God knows. God wants to withhold from you. You see, the devil is accusing God, saying God is not being good to you. God is not being kind to you. God is messing you up and he's accusing him. But as we give thanks to the Lord, we are brought back into reality. And it has divine power to break strongholds that are in our lives. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Now this morning, I want to be preaching on this, and I want to give some full disclosure first. <laughs> and that is, you know, from time to time, not very often, but from time to time, I'll feel like the Lord is calling me to, to pull a message out of the archives, you know? Usually that's not the case, but I'm open to that if he wants to do that. Well, I want to say that the bones of this message, this will be the fifth time I've preached the bones of this message. Of course, every time it's different, but the bones, the skeleton, the structure, this will be the fifth time. And the reason is because I believe it is so important. There's some things that we need to hear more than once. Can I hear you say amen? You know, in fact, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, so I will always remind you of these things. I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them, and are firmly established in the truth you now have. There's some things that we need to be reminded of, and this is one of them, the importance of thanksgiving. And so the message this morning is called A Case for Giving Thanks. I want to present to you a case for giving thanks. Why it's so important that we do so. And the first reason I want to give you is it is the language of heaven. Giving thanks is the language of heaven. When Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, one thing that we should include is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what's happening in heaven, God is wanting to, he's were to pray that it will be taking place on earth. And so the question is, what is happening in heaven? Well, I'll tell you what's happening, a whole lot of thanksgiving. And we see in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 16 and 17, it says, and the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Heaven is full of thanksgiving. And we pray 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thanksgiving is the language of heaven. Can you imagine if when you, you know, leave this earth and you stand before the pearly gates and you say, you say, why should you be able to come in? You say, because I believe in Jesus and the door opens, gate opens. And you come in and you get in there and you're just so excited. I mean, it's just, <laughs> this is heaven. And you get in there and all, all you find is people going, oh, the food here stinks. Oh, I can't stand. Is there a smell in the air? Do you pick up some kind? And it's all this grumbling and complaining going on. You think, this is heaven? No, that's not what we anticipate. Heaven is going to be a place of thanksgiving, a place of joy, and that's what the language of heaven is. Uh, there's a fellow who entered a monastery where he had to take a vow of silence, and you could, you, for the whole year, you had to say nothing, nothing. And then at the end of a year, you were allowed to say two words to the abbot. And so he went the whole year biting his tongue, saying nothing, and then he comes before the abbot, and the abbot says, well, you have your chance to say two words. What would you like to say? And if, what he says is, cold rooms. And that's it. Another year of silence. Nothing he can say. And at the end of the second year, he comes before the abbot again. And the abbot says, well, you've been silent for another year. Good work. What would you like to say? Uncomfortable beds. And that's it. He has to be silent for another year. And so for a whole year, he's biting his tongue, can't say anything, vow of silence. After the third year, he comes before the abbot, and the abbot says, well, you made it three years, and what would you like to say this year? You can say two words, and he says, lousy food. <laughs> Gets another year of silence. He's been, God had his two words, he holds his tongue for another year, and finally at the end of that year, he stands before the abbot and the abbot says, you can say your two words, and what are they, my brother? And he says, I quit. <laughs> and the abbot says, well, all you ever did was complain anyway. <laughs> what if we got to heaven and we found all there was was complaining going on and murmuring and grumbling? You know that's not what heaven's like. Heaven is going to be a place of worship a place of rejoicing, a place of thanksgiving, a place of exalting. I mean, it's beyond what we can really imagine. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And so, so thanksgiving is the language of heaven. And we sing this song, a thankful heart prepares the way for you, O God. When you have a household or a community that is full of gratitude and appreciation for one another and for God's blessing, it is a thing of beauty, and it is a little bit of heaven on earth. Not only does it bring heaven on earth in atmosphere, but we actually, if I can put it this way, we actually cultivate the presence of God in our lives and in our, in our midst through thanksgiving. You know, there are some things that we just really love to be in amongst. There's some atmospheres that we really enjoy, and it, and, and it varies for every one of us, I'm sure. When I was a, a, a boy and an early teen, I used to just love to go to the store and go in amongst the power tools. I love the table saws. I love the radial alarms. I drool over them. The drill press, and I just think, oh, one day I'd love to have a shop of my own and have all of these power tools and do woodworking. And just, it just was so, uh, I just love being there. I could just spend hours here looking at these things. I also love to go to stores where they had exercise equipment and hang around the weights. And I love to look at the weights and the different benches they had. And I just would dream about having my own gym, you know, that kind of thing. I love to be in those places. It was some place I just felt so comfortable and, and, uh, and just uh, enthralled. And now I still love those places, but I enjoy the outdoors, the autumn leaves or the, the, the reflection of the sun on the water in the summer. There's just beautiful. There's places that we just love to be. Well, you know, God is the same. There's places that he loves to be, and one of those places is in the midst of thanksgiving, in the midst of praise. He loves that atmosphere. And so as we give thanks and as we praise him, it is a place where he just loves to be. It's a, it's a comfortable atmosphere for him. The Bible says in, in, in Psalm 22, 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. 
Thanksgiving is a language of heaven. It's where God finds comfort and it expresses what is going on in heaven. The other thought, another thought is that Thanksgiving is an attitude of gratitude, expresses an attitude of gratitude. Say attitude of gratitude. gratitude. You'll never forget that. That's a cool phrase, isn't it? Attitude of gratitude. And Thanksgiving, it expresses that kind of attitude. Not only does it express it, but it also releases it. And the words that we say are powerful. Though every word we speak is a seed that we sow. If we could understand that, that could radically transform the words that come out of our mouths. But in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, we need to understand that eternal life is not just quantitative, but it's qualitative. And eternal life isn't just something that we experience after we leave this earth. It is something we experience right now. Jesus defined in John 17, 3, eternal life this way. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so as we sow to please the Spirit, we actually are encouraged in our walk with Jesus and knowing him more. And so we say, well, with our words, what is sowing to please the Spirit? Well, it's really interesting. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul is talking about the gift of tongues, and what the gift of tongues is, is the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Speaking, you speaking through your spirit. Him speak, you speaking, but him giving the words. And in 1 Corinthians 14, where it says what the Spirit is saying, it says he is giving thanks. The Holy Spirit speaking through someone in the gift of tongues is giving thanks to God. You see, the language of the Spirit is thanksgiving. And so in Galatians chapter 6, where it says, those who sow to please the Spirit reap eternal life, well, we know that as we give thanks, that it is reaping, the, the effect of it is going to be reaping eternal life in our lives. So in Proverbs 18, 21, it says, the tongue has a power of life and death. Now, if I was to say to you that the words that you say to others may impact them, I'm sure I'd get very little argument from you. But what we can fail to realize sometimes is that though the words we say to others may impact them, the words we speak will definitely impact us. See, what we say may get, affect others. There's a very good chance, unless they have filters, depending on what you're saying. It can affect for good, mind you. You can speak, speak words of life, but speaking words of death, they're going to have to have some pretty strong filters for it not to affect them, but they can. But if you speak words of death, it most certainly will affect you. It will affect your well-being, your spiritual life. And so what we say, though it may be in the form of a thought, as soon as we speak it, it begins to take power. And so we're told in James chapter 3, in verses 3 to 5, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Now, I want you to notice the imagery of what James is using here. He's saying that a bit is, I mean, it's it's puny. I mean, you look at a bit compared to a horse, it's just this little, you know, stick, basically. And yet it can turn the whole animal. Or a rudder, it's just when you compare a rudder to the size of a ship, and yet it steers the direction of that ship. And what he's saying is the tongue also steers our lives. And what we say will affect the course of our lives. And, and, you know, even when it comes to salvation, it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Even our salvation, our, the, the use of our tongue is related to it. But 
But as we speak in our everyday life, we don't understand how much that is affecting our demeanor. We don't understand how much that is affecting the way we view things and our relationships and our outlooks and our sense of tomorrow. You start talking about what a drag your life is and pretty soon you're going to believe it. <laughs> you start talking about how lousy a person is then you're going to start looking at them more and more as pretty lousy. And you complain about the misery you have to endure. You are creating for yourself more misery. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because the tongue steers us. It steers our lives. It steers our thoughts. It steers our outlook. On the other hand, as you thank God for his many blessings, which are beyond counting, it will steer your life toward joy and positivity. I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about being in touch with the way things really are. When you give thanks, it brings perspective. We become aware of God's great blessings. And when you have an attitude of gratitude, you are more pleasant to be around as well. And that's not a bad thing, unless you want to be by yourself. It's not a bad thing to be pleasant to be around. It is, I believe it is impossible to be thankful and to be sour at the same time. And I also believe that it's impossible to be bitter and to be thankful at the same time. And sometimes if we're not finding thankfulness coming out of our mouths, you know, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, it's good for us to have a heart checkup. I'm talking about before the Lord. Proverbs 20, 27, the lamp of the Lord searches the spirit of a man and searches out its inmost being. Let the Lord search and show us what's happening. Why are we not thankful? And is there a bitterness? Is there a sourness? But I believe it's impossible to be sour and thankful at the same time. God, giving thanks to God simply makes you happier. Now, I just want to qualify that there is most certainly a time for speaking things that you need to talk through. Things when you're going through deep waters, and we all can go through deep waters. And at times like that, we need to know that we can actually share what's happening in our hearts without somebody coming back with a pat answer saying, you should be thankful. I mean, that's not going to be helpful in those times, right? But even when we're in the deepest of waters, what we want to see our destination to be is thankfulness. And even when we feel at the lowest point, we understand by faith that God is good. And though we don't feel it, we, we want to give thanks and trust that ultimately, at the end of the day, our hearts and our experiences, our feelings are going to line up with that thankfulness that is on our lips. So, but I don't want to suggest a callous, you know, like one who takes away a garment on a cold day is he who sings songs so a heavy heart, Proverbs 25, 20. You know what I'm saying? We want to be real about this. But Thanksgiving is our destination. And there's times when it's harder, but it doesn't mean it's not the appropriate thing. And so Thanksgiving, it, it releases as well as conveys an attitude of gratitude. Now, pro the third thing is unwavering faith. Thanksgiving helps with un un to have unwavering faith. It says of Abraham, who is called our father in the faith in Romans chapter 4, that he did not waver through unbelief. And thanksgiving is the language of faith. It is easy to be thankful when everything is happy and going well. You know, you're getting a raise or a promotion, it's easy to be thankful. Your kid scores the winning goal in soccer. Oh, it's good, easy to be thankful then. <laughs> you buy a new car, it's easy to be thankful until that first payment comes. Um, <laughs> you waste that exam, it's easy to be thankful. Your football team wins the game, it's easy to be thankful. And my football team did not win the game two nights ago. I was not feeling thankful, but I could by faith thank the Lord anyway. <laughs> Any CFL football? I know there's so many NFL footballs, but come on, guys. We're Canadian. Any CFL football fans here? Am I? Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. There's four of us. It's a good thing. Listen, it only takes two or three for our prayers to be answered, so we got four, you know. But um, we can be thankful not just in some circumstances, not just in fun circumstances, not just in enjoyable circumstances, 
But in all circumstances, the Lord has called us to be thankful. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very authentic. It sounds more like denial to me. But giving thanks is the most reality-based thing you can do if you're a child of God. It has nothing to do with inauthenticity or denial. Rather, it has to do with being in touch with and affirming the way things really and truly are, even when you don't feel it, even when you don't see it, even when you're not experiencing it. It brings you in touch with the way things really and truly are. Thanksgiving expresses faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If we know that, then thanksgiving is actually an expression of faith because all of us know that it doesn't always seem this way. It doesn't always seem like God is working for the good. And the reason it doesn't always seem that way is because we see so little. We have such a limited vision compared to the scope that God has. And so we're at times in a position where we're saying we just have to believe that what he is saying is true and that all things that God is working for the good of those who love him. And thanksgiving is expressing that faith. We are trusting that because all things work for the good of those who love him, then we can give thanks in all circumstances. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No matter what is going on around us, we are able to give thanks because we know that God is working for our good in those situations. You say, well, I don't see everything around me as being super awesome. And I will just respond to you, I totally get it. I totally get it. There are times when it just really doesn't seem super awesome. And there are times when we are just uh, crumbling on the inside. I totally get it. And, uh, and so does Jesus. And he's not unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But even in those times, we are called in Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6 to trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. You know, when we trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding, that's the smartest thing we can do. And though our own understanding and our own experiences and our own five senses reality may be harsh, and they, and Jesus does not minimize that at all, but he invites us toward help, and that is to trust him and to know that he knows what we don't know. It's wise to not lean on our own understanding and rather to lean on God's understanding because God is omniscient, and that means he knows all things. He sees all things. He understands all things, and he has all wisdom. You know, our understanding is like a slug's compared to God's. And so we are really actually foolish to just lean on our own perspective and our own ability to see things. But as we trust in him, the omniscient one, the one who's from everlasting to everlasting, the one who not only knows all things, but in fact, he is love personified. And he not only knows all things and not only loves, but he has the power, he's the omnipotent one to carry out what is best for his people. And so he calls us, listen, I don't minimize what you're going through, but here is some help. Trust me. And as you trust him, that is an expression of your faith in him. It expresses your faith. Now, I want to just qualify. It says that, that we give thanks in all circumstances. And I do believe that's different than giving thanks for all circumstances. I don't give thanks for someone's sin, but I give thanks even if that sin is messing up my life. I don't have to give thanks for their sin, but I can give thanks in the midst of it, that God can use even something that is intended for evil for my good. He's not limited by what other people do, and he's not limited by the temptations of the devil. I don't thank God for the devil's temptations, 
but I thank God in the midst of it that he strengthened me. Are you understanding what I'm saying? There's a difference. But thanksgiving is an expression of faith. And not only is thanksgiving an expression of faith, but thanksgiving releases faith. And this is so important for us to understand. When you begin to thank, thank God for his goodness and his faithfulness in your life, you cannot help but be strengthened in your faith. How many know that faith is a good thing? <laughs> How many know it's, without faith it is impossible to please God? I mean, Peter says it's more precious than gold, though refined by fire. But faith is, you know, it's more precious than gold. That's pretty valuable. And as we give thanks, not only is it expressing faith, but it is strengthening us in our faith. When you are discouraged, the best thing you can do is give thanks. When you are anxious or full of worry, the best thing that you can do is give thanks. Begin to thank the Lord. Remember times he's come through for you in the past. And as you give thanks for that, then you can start giving thanks for what he's going to do in the future. He came through then. He's going to come through now. He is the God who knows all and he has all power. And as we give thanks to him, it brings about a rest in our soul. When you are in fear and, and full of anxiety, the best thing that you can do is give thanks to God. Again, it is a weapon that has divine power to demolish strongholds. I cannot count the number of times when I've started to give thanks to the Lord and my whole world has changed. Nothing's changed and yet everything's changed because I'm looking at it through a different lens. I begin looking at it not through the hope or the thought of doom. And, oh, what's around the corner? Oh my goodness, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. It's, you know, the boom's going to fall. But rather I just begin to realize God is good and he has a hope and a future and he loves me and he's going to do awesome things. And you know what I'm saying? And it's like God, it, the whole world changes just through the simple act of giving thanks because that's what God has called us to do and has power. And when you give thanks, you are brought back in touch with true reality. The fourth thing is giving glory to God. When we give thanks, we give glory to God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. I want you to notice the correlation between glorifying God and giving thanks to him. How many of you want to bring glory to God in your life? Giving thanks is one way you can do it. Pretty simple, eh? I mean, it's pretty simple, but it's powerful. I love, uh, I mentioned football earlier, and uh, I was, I try to, when I can, you know, I always record the BC Lions, but I don't always get to watch them. And if they lose, I don't even bother trying. But um, if they win, I do like to see, you know, at least highlights. But uh, their, um, their quarterback, if you're a fan, anybody? <laughs> they're, I, you all are. You all are, I know that. Um, but their quarterback, he, um, you can tell he's a believer. And I, I'm, it's, I think it's a gift of discernment that enables me to tell because when he wears a charcoal on his face, he has a cross. I think that's a sign of something. And then, uh, but what's, what's more is it's so cool. Every time he's interviewed, he says, you know, I just want to thank God. I just want to give glory to God. I'm so grateful for what God has done for me. He just, and I don't know what the reporters are thinking. Think, oh, okay, brace yourself. You know what's going to happen because he does it without exception every time. And I just think that's so awesome. And any time the team scores a touchdown, afterward he's going, he's pointing up, you know. You know what he's doing? He's giving thanks to God. And you know what he's doing when he's giving thanks to God? He's glorifying him. And I'm just thrilled with the way he's doing it. I love it when I see these guys doing it because I think of the kids and I think of the, the older kids that are watching the game and I just think they are having a testimony of God before their eyes. And he's giving glory to God. How? By giving thanks to God and saying, thank you, Lord, that we're able to do this. And then as we give thanks to God just as surely as him and those other folks do we are giving glory to God as well and finally finally my last point is giving thanks to God is an act of humility act of humility how many know that humility is a good thing the Bible says that God opposes the proud but gives grace and humble I can use all the grace I can get and as I'm giving thanks to God I'm actually humbling myself 
Because I'm saying that, God, what you have done or what has happened here is not because of some random circumstances, and it's not because of my own greatness, but it's because of your blessing. And that is a voice of humility coming through. The Bible says in Isaiah 26 and verse 12, Lord, you establish peace for us. All that we have accomplished, you have done for us. And as we give thanks to God, we're humbling ourselves and saying, this isn't about my own greatness. This isn't about random universe, but it's about you. And we humble ourselves before him. We recognize that he is good and it's his goodness that is coming through. God is so good, isn't he? You know, giving thanks in all circumstances is really something that we are called to do, not so that God can get his jollies, but it's for our benefit. It's not like the Lord saying, come on, just give me the strokes, man. I'm feeling a little bit discouraged. I need to hear it from you. Let me hear it. Throw me a bone, will you? No, it's nothing like that. But rather, as we are called to give thanks, what's happening is for our benefit, we are being brought in touch with what really is true in this whole universe, and that God is at the center of all things, and that he is good, and he is loving. And if we have a life, of, uh, not, a life that is not full of thanksgiving, uh, what happens is we become self-centered, and we begin to see ourselves at the center of our universe, and that is so unhealthy for us. But as we give thanks and we put him at the fore, we understand what the reality truly is. You know, in Romans chapter 1, we saw that it says that they neither gave thanks to God nor glorified him. And we see that. And if you were to look at the passage, you would see that it's the beginning of a progression or a, a regression into one sin after another, deeper and deeper and deeper of the sin of a society. And it starts with them neither giving thanks to God nor glorifying him. And I believe, I don't know if a survey has ever been taken, but I believe that... It, if you were to look at people who have fallen away from the Lord, what you would not find is someone who is in the practice of giving thanks to God regularly, having an attitude of thanksgiving, giving thanks to him. You know, when we stop doing that, it can be the beginning of a downward spiral. But as we continue to give thanks to God, continue to acknowledge him, continue to express our faith, continue to humble ourselves before him, as we do these things, we are being tied, we're tethered to him, and it's helping us to keep a perspective that is really true and based in reality. So the psalmist says, I will give thanks. And I'm so glad it says, uh, it doesn't say, I will give thanks when I feel like it. I will give thanks when it's groovy. But he says, I will give thanks. We can do it all the time in all circumstances. What a gift, what a blessing that is for us. Now in closing, Proverbs 31 talks about the Proverbs 31 woman. What a coincidence. Um, and one of the things about her is it says she can laugh at the days to come. And when you live a life of thanksgiving, you will be able to laugh at tomorrow and have grace for today. Can I hear you say Amen. Amen. God is good. Yes. <laughs> well, let's pray. Let's pray and ask the Lord just to take this word. Father, I believe this is such an important word. I am helped by it when I prepare it, when I think about it. I'm helped when I preach it. And uh, I just thank you that I and we, I'm sure I speak for every one of us, need reminding need reminding, just like Peter said, I'll always remind you of these things. And Lord, this is one thing. That is pretty easy to lean on our own understanding at times. And there are times when if we lean on our own understanding, Thanksgiving's not coming. But you have called us to something higher. You've called us to a life of faith, Lord, where we see the invisible, Lord. And uh, we pray that you take this word and that for every one of us, it would be a strength, Lord, an encouragement. And Lord, I truly believe that the life of thanksgiving is a life that is transformed. That as we give thanks to you, it just causes us to, to need to root out bitterness, 
to need to root out sourness, Lord God. No bitter root can survive in a life of thanksgiving. And when we find ourselves not wanting to give thanks, it causes us to find out why. So I pray that you take this word and you just really bless it and cause it to be life-changing for each one of us. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.